Hale Space Institute as an assistant professor, so we're really very happy to have him here. Um, so Adrian got his PhD from MIT and then got a very prestigious NASA Hubble Fellowship that he completed at uh, UC Berkeley. So Adrian's work is primarily centered on radio observation of what we call uh, the, the end of the dark age or near the end of the dark age. So basically when uh, star and galaxy started to form. So Adrian is also um, passionate about science, communication, and education. And as proof of that, he also uh, was the recipient of the Goodwin Teaching Medal from MIT, as well as the Origin Project Prize postdoc lectureship from Arizona State University. And so without further ado, please uh, give a round of applause to Dr. Adrian Liu. All right, can everyone hear me? Yeah? Great. Can we dim the lights a little bit? Yeah. All right, so thanks very much to all the Astro McGill people for uh, organizing this. It's great to be here. And today I'm gonna do something that's a little bit unusual. So usually, when we scientists talk, give public talks, we like to parade our accomplishments, right? We tell you all about the great discoveries we've made, um, about the cool new results we've seen, you know, regarding the universe, regarding biology, regarding chemistry, whatever it is. Today, I'm basically not gonna do that, okay? Today, I am going to talk about, do something unusual. I'm going to provide a bit of a sneak preview for a field that hasn't yet reached maturity in astrophysics and cosmology. Um, and so that way, when hopefully a few years from now, when we've got great new results, uh, and you read about them in a newspaper or something, uh, you'll be able to say, you know, I knew about all of that before it was cool. Okay, so I am a cosmologist. So what does that mean? That means I worry about our universe on its very, very largest scales, okay? I don't worry about whether a planet formed over here or a galaxy formed over there, what type of star or sun is. All those are very interesting questions, but those aren't my job, okay? I only worry about the universe on its largest scales uh, and our universe's history. You know, how our universe on a whole came to be. All right, so if I'm gonna talk about our universe on its largest scales, a really good place to start is to just ask, how big is it? Um, and if you got here early, you actually had some nice uh, multiple choice questions about that already. But let's start from the beginning. Let's start from the Earth, where we live. So the Earth is obviously a huge place as far as humans are concerned, right? Compared to human scales, the Earth is huge. The diameter of the Earth, 8,000 miles. Obviously, it takes a long time to traverse something like an 8,000 mile diameter. But for light, the Earth is a really small place, okay? Light, this thing that travels at the cosmic speed limit. Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. The diameter of the Earth only takes 43 milliseconds to traverse, 43 thousandths of a second. And so what we say is that the Earth's diameter is 43 milli light seconds, okay? Now, of course, there's more to the universe than the Earth. Um, and zooming out a little bit, we've got the solar system. We've got the sun, Earth orbiting around the sun, and all these other planets. And now you're talking orders of magnitude larger, right? From the sun all the way to say, um, some of the outer planets, say Neptune or something, you're talking about 
five billion miles approximately. Okay, so many, many, many billions of miles. And even for light, traveling at the cosmic speed limit, it takes five hours to get from the sun to the outer solar system. Okay. All right, great. You can see where this is going. Um, the sun isn't the only star in our universe. And if we zoom out again, we get nearby stars, our closest neighbors. And again, we've gone up in scale, right? 25,000 billion miles to the nearest star, okay? To, to the Centauri system, our closest neighbors, all right? Um, and even light, even light takes four years to get from the Centauri system to our eyes or our telescopes. Now, if you go out into the country and you look up at the night sky, you will typically find many more stars than what I am showing here. And of course, there are many, there are many more stars. Uh, there are lots of us orbiting the, the center of what we call the Milky Way galaxy. So we are part of the Milky Way galaxy, this collection of 100 billion stars all orbiting this common center. And we're kind of like halfway out on one of these nice spiral arms, okay? This, you can't read it here, this is a local stellar neighborhood. And this is gigantic, right? 100 billion stars and the extent of what I'm showing here, half of a billion billion miles, right? A billion of a billion miles, okay? Uh, and even light, 100,000 years for light to cross the diameter of the Milky Way, all right? So at least to me, this was the first time when I learned about this, was, you know, how, when, it was, when it really struck me just how big space is, all right? So some of you might know about the Voyager probes, right? These little satellite-like spacecrafts um, that were shot basically through the solar system and out of the solar system in the 70s, traveling at many, many times the speed of a speeding bullet. Okay, so, you know, some of the fastest things we've ever launched. And between the 1970s and now, the remarkable thing is that the Voyager probes are only just now getting just beyond scraping the edge of the influence of the sun, okay? So the sun lies much within a single pixel on this picture, and these Voyager probes haven't even left the pixel that they started in, okay? The universe really is a big place. And this is not it, right? The Milky Way isn't the only galaxy out here. This is what we call the local group. We've got the Milky Way here uh, surrounding us are a bunch of smaller galaxies, uh, dwarf galaxies we call them. But our nearest neighbor is Andromeda. So Andromeda is another galaxy, again, with um, lots of hundreds of billions of stars, and Andromeda is something of comparable mass to our, our Milky Way galaxy. And with Andromeda, you're talking about being 15 billion billion miles away, okay? Light takes two and a half million years to get from Andromeda to us, okay? 2.5 million light years. Okay, the story repeats itself, okay? Just as within a galaxy, you've got lots of stars orbiting a common center, there are things in our universe known as galaxy clusters, where you've got thousands of galaxies orbiting a common center, okay? Um, so these galaxy clusters um, exist in the universe, there are lots of them. Turns out that we don't live in the heart of a galaxy cluster, but we are part of something even bigger, the Virgo supercluster, which as you can imagine consists of a whole bunch of galaxy clusters, okay? This is named after uh, the Virgo cluster, which is an example of the uh, sort of galaxy cluster that I mentioned uh, just now, okay? And so you can imagine that, you know, if this were like a big uh, metropolitan area, the Virgo cluster is like downtown, and we're not quite downtown, but we're also not way out in the country. The Milky Way is nicely situated kind of in the suburbs, 
okay? It's a good location. All right, so, but to go from the Milky Way to the Virgo cluster, 400 billion billion miles, okay? 65 million light years away, okay? 65 million years for light to get from Virgo to us. And I'm just gonna do this one more time. Everything you see on this slide fits into one pixel here, okay? So the universe is ridiculously huge, all right? And as cosmologists, we worry about, you know, you look at something like this, what are the patterns here, right? Like, is there something, some pattern I can discern here that tells me something about how the universe behaves? All right, so one reaction you might have, have to this, um, about the, you know, with the universe being so big, is that's awesome, you know, like this is just awe-inspiring. Um, Another reaction you can have, which is actually the reaction that my sister has, is that that's really disappointing, okay? Because what that means um, is, you know, with something like Virgo being so far away, suppose I wanted to visit Virgo, all right? Um, you know, never mind how I'm gonna build a spaceship to do that, that's an engineer's job, I'm not gonna worry about that. But let's say my engineer, engineering friends tell me that they've built uh, a spaceship that can go close to the speed of light. It turns out that according to the rules of relativity, you can actually um, head to Virgo and come back, but because it's so far away, it would basically take, you know, your friends on Earth would basically have to, to wait uh, 130 million years for you to get back, 65 times two, and obviously they'd be dead by the time you came back, right? So you wouldn't be able to tell them um, what an amazing place the you know downtown Virgo supercluster is, right? Okay, so that's a little bit disappointing if you want to think about things that way. But if you think about it a little bit more, the fact that the universe is so big and the fact that there's a cosmic speed limit, the speed of light, is a great gift to observational cosmology. Because what it means is that the night sky is a time machine, okay? And here's how it works. So suppose I look at the Centauri system, right? Four light years away, that means that light takes four years to travel from that system to my eyes, okay? What that also means is that the light that I'm seeing today isn't light that's being emitted now, it is light that was emitted four years ago. I am seeing old light. Look at something 4,000 light years away. That light had to have started towards me 4,000 years ago. I am seeing 4,000 year old light, which is another way of saying, I am seeing that thing as it was 4,000 years ago, not as it is now. Here's a concrete example. This is the Crab Nebula, okay, which is basically a cosmic graveyard. This is the remnant of what happens when um, some, a massive star explodes as it's dying um, in what we call a supernova. And this thing, because it's about 6,500 light years away, this is what it looked like 6,500 years ago. That's how long it takes this light to get to us. By now, Androm not Androm like the Crab Nebula will have evolved. Okay. Here's an even more extreme example. You might have heard about this from, um, from last year, where for basically the first time, astronomers were able to get a lot of really great data across all sorts of instruments um, of the collision of two neutron stars. And you can think of neutron stars as basically like uh, big clumps of nuclear matter, okay? So if you are familiar with atoms, think like a gigantic nucleus, okay? It's so a two of these colliding. Now, because this happened 120 million light years away, this collision, which we kind of saw, you know, in some sense in real time, um, happening, unfolding over, well, the collision itself, you can think about happening over the time scale of minutes, but also some of the follow-up observations happening over months, we saw that in real time. 
but all of that happened 120 million years ago. Okay, so we get to see history in real time in cosmology. Okay, and by now, if you somehow could magically transport yourself there, um, this collision event would be long done. Um, and, you know, just as a little advertisement, there are people here at McGill who do some great work on this. Uh, Professor Daryl Haggard's group, for instance, has done a lot of the observations and interpretations of this. Complete extreme here. Suppose I looked at some of the most distant galaxies we can see today. These galaxies are billions of light years away. Okay? That means we are looking at these galaxies uh, as they were billions of years ago. And given that our universe is about 14 billion years old, a little less than that, um, we're really peering deep into our universe's history. We're really making good use of our night sky time machine. Okay? So here's the general principle. The farther away we look, the farther back we're seeing in time. And diagrammatically, if this is us looking outwards from the Earth, if I want to see our universe as it was 10 years ago, I look 10 light years away. If I want to see the universe as it was 20 years ago, I look 20 light years away because that's how long it takes the light to get from that outer ring to me. All right, so if someone hands you a time machine, the obvious temptation is to figure out how far back you can turn the knob, right? Like how far back can I actually go? And how far back have we gone with this time machine? So as we've established, if the farther back you want to go, the farther away you have to look. So it follows that in order to answer this question, we have to ask how far away are we able to see things in our universe? Now, so again, if this is us here, if you think about it, there are parts of the universe way out here that are so far away that in the entire age of the universe, light hasn't had enough time to get to us from those distant regions, okay? The universe just isn't old enough for that. And so parts outside this blue circle are unobservable. No matter how much money you put into this, no matter how many telescopes you build, how big the telescopes are, you will never see um, what's outside this blue ring, okay? So what's inside this blue ring is in principle observable. This is known as the observable universe, okay? Now, by definition, if the universe is 13.8 billion years old, then this ring is 13.8 billion light years away because this ring represents the parts of the universe where light has just had enough time to get to my eyes, okay? Now, that would be pretty cool if I could see that, right? Because if I'm looking 13.8 billion light years away and our universe is 13.8 billion years old, I can basically turn my time machine knob all the way back to time t equal to zero. That'd be pretty cool. Now it turns out that we can't quite look that far back, okay? It turns out that we can almost get all the way to t equal to zero, but in practice, we can only get to about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, okay? And there's some really great physics that goes into explaining why that is, and I'll talk about that now. So one thing we've learned about our universe by s making observations, studying it, working on mathematical theories and all that, is that our universe is expanding, okay? So as I look farther and farther away and I'm looking back in time, I am seeing a smaller universe, okay? Now, take the same amount of stuff, same amount of stars and galaxies and all that, and if you're gonna push it into a smaller volume, then that implies that the, the stuff that you're looking at must be denser, right? You've taken the same amount of stuff, squished it into a smaller volume, okay? So the earlier universe was denser than a present day universe, okay? Put another way, as the universe expands, things spread out, things get less dense. Now, 
if you have a bike and you've pumped up your bike tires recently, what you know is that if you compress something very, very quickly, it tends to heat up, right? Your bike pump gets hot when, when you pump your bike. Same thing goes for our universe. The early universe is not only smaller, denser, but it's also hotter, okay? Another way of saying that is that as our universe expands, it cools. All right, so what does that mean for our observations? So I'm looking forward and forward back in time, okay? I'm looking forward and forward away, so I look forward and forward back in time. And initially, things aren't that different. I've only looked a little bit back in time. And the universe, you know, maybe is a little bit hotter, but not that much hotter, right? So all the phases of matter that we're used to and all that, the universe basically looks the same. We have the familiar atoms and so on. Now, I keep looking farther and farther away because I want to look as far back in time as I possibly can. Eventually, I am going to get to a point where I'm looking so far back in the universe's history that the universe is so hot and so dense that it turns out that atoms cannot stably exist, okay? If you imagine um, atoms consisting of, say, a nucleus with a bunch of electrons being bound to them in this sort of really orderly fashion, the early universe is so hot and so, so, and so energetic of a place that these individual particles have enough energy that they can basically rip themselves free of this really ordered configuration. And really the early universe, the early hot, dense universe um, consists of what we call plasma, this big soup of charged particles buzzing around, okay? All right, what does that mean? Now, the really important thing about this is that plasmas are generically not transparent, okay? Let's unpack that a little bit. What do I mean when I say that, um, some th say the air in this room is transparent? What I mean is light bouncing off your faces can travel to my eyes in straight lines and they don't get disrupted on, on their way to my eyes. This is not the case for a plasma. As you have these you know, little bits of light coming through, it's such a charged, energetic, you know, busy place, this charged um, soup that we call plasma with all these particles, they knock um, the light every which way. So the light tries to travel in a straight line, but very quickly it encounters this energetic particle that um, knocks it a different way, tries to move in a straight line again, it gets knocked again, and so on. And so because light can't travel coherently in these straight lines, plasmas are not transparent, they're opaque, okay? Whereas in today's universe, right, with all these atoms and so on, largely speaking, the universe is pretty transparent, okay? What does this mean? Okay, so I'm going to look farther and farther and farther away to look forward and forward back in time. And as I look forward and forward and forward back in time, as I walk this way, go forward and forward, the universe gets hotter and hotter and hotter, hotter. Eventually it gets hot enough that um, the universe is a plasma. Plasmas aren't transparent, so I hit a wall, right? There's a plasma screen beyond which I can't see. Well, that's a shame. So let's go the other way, right? I'm now gonna start looking forward and forward away in this direction. Um, as I do that, I'm looking forward and forward and forward and forward and back in time. Uh, eventually, the universe that I'm looking at is hot enough that, again, it's a plasma, and I hit another plasma screen beyond which I can't see anything. Okay. The same logic holds in any direction I look, and therefore, we can conclude that surrounding us, okay, in our universe, is this you know, 360 pl IMAX plasma screen. Okay, all right, so that sounds like a bit of a shame because, well, you're like, well, I really wanted to look as far away as possible, but now there's this plasma screen in the way. Turns out, again, that this plasma screen is a great gift to us. And the way to understand that is to think about cloud watching, okay? All right, you look at a cloud, and clouds, like plasmas, are generally not transparent unless they're super duper thin and wispy, but generally clouds are not transparent. And that's again because the water vapor in the cloud 
uh, knocks light uh, in all sorts of directions, light can't travel in straight lines, and so therefore clouds are not transparent. Unlike the air here, where the light can, to a large extent, travel in a straight line all the way to our eyes. Now what does this mean? This means when I look at clouds, I only see an outline of the cloud. I can't see into the cloud, just like a plasma screen. I see the plasma screen, I can't see what's you know, on the other side of the plasma screen. This means that when I look at a cloud, I see a snapshot of its outline. Same thing for my plasma screen. As I look at my plasma screen, I see a particular snapshot in space. Okay, so I'm seeing what the universe looks like right here. But remember, looking a certain distance away is also looking back in time. So this is not only a snapshot in space, this is a snapshot in time. Okay, and it turns out that when we look at um, this plasma screen in our universe, we are looking at a photograph of our universe when it was just 400,000 years old, okay? And remember, the universe is about 13.8 billion years old, so 400,000 is when the universe was basically a baby. And we've done that, okay? This is known as the cosmic microwave background. That's the technical name for this plasma screen. So this here is real data, okay? Uh, in fact, this was uh, taken by something that was on the front page of the New York Times a few years ago. This was taken by the Planck satellite, uh, basically a microwave telescope that was sent into space, uh, pre designed, special, specially designed to take these pictures of the baby universe. Now, you look at this picture of the baby universe, and the first thing you might notice is that it looks really lumpy. Okay. Uh, you know, it's not a very smooth baby. It's got all these little um, blemishes, right? Now, it turns out it's, you know, they're, they are, our baby's not that lumpy. Um, the reddest red parts here are parts of the universe that are 10 parts in a million, uh, denser than average. And the bluest blue parts are parts of the universe that are 10 parts in a million, less dense than average. Okay, so I mean, if this were your skin, you wouldn't even notice that. So it, our baby universe is basically smooth with these tiny little, uh, little clumps of extra dense and extra undense bits, okay? Which might seem like a bit of a detail, but it turns out that we owe our entire existence to these tiny little lumps, okay? And here's how it works. So what we're um, about to see here is a movie, okay, where physicists have taken uh, initial little clumps of matter, 10 parts in a million more dense than average, and put them on a computer, okay, and just let time run forward. And let's just see what happens. Now what you notice is that there's an interesting effect due to gravity. If this little part started out 10 parts in a million denser than average, that means this little part of the universe just has that much more matter than its neighbors. And if it's got that, just the tiniest bit more matter, it's going to have slightly stronger gravity, which allows it to pull in extra matter, okay? And if this other part of the universe has a little bit less matter than average, it's not gonna, it's gonna have a little less gravity, it's not gonna be able to hold on to things quite as tightly, and it's gonna have mass stolen away from it, okay? So there's basically a reverse Robin Hood effect, right, where the dense parts get even denser because they're stealing mass from the less dense parts, which get even less dense. Now, eventually these really dense parts get dense enough to ignite the first stars and galaxies, okay? And what you're seeing here with these explosions are basically the deaths of the first uh, stars, which then go, go on and push stuff back out into the intergalactic medium space between galaxies. Okay. And as time goes on, you see we're now uh, almost nine billion years after the Big Bang, okay? Um, and as time goes on, reverse Robin Hood continues, right? Gravity is relentless. It's not, doesn't really turn off, right? And so, 
these stars and galaxies are going to continue to form. You know, mass is going to continue to, to be grabbed on by these dense parts. And as we approach the present day, what you'll notice is that um, these are beginning to look like some of the observational pictures of galaxies um, that you've, we've, we now have access to with modern observations. And so in the, it's only been in the last sort of, um, say, uh, five, 10 years that we've been able to get some really, really nice uh, cosmological simulations that really we think are very coarsely matching uh, reality. And so if you like these sorts of movies, there are lots of them on the internet, on YouTube. Um, this particular set was done by Professor Mark Vogelsberger of MIT and his team. Um, here's another one that is a little bit closer to my work. This is done by um, one of my colleagues, Marcelo Alvarez at UC Berkeley. And he and I, are particularly interested in a particular phase of that really long evolution that I showed in the last movie. What you're seeing here is the formation of the first galaxies. And you're not actually seeing the galaxies, but what you're seeing are these first galaxies giving off extremely intense forms of light, things like UV radiation and X-rays. And these UV and X-rays go off into the intergalactic medium, the space between the galaxies, and they ionize any material that's there. So these blue regions are these ionized regions, these ionized bubbles that form around the first galaxies. And as time goes on, these uh, blue bubbles get larger and larger, um, and eventually they merge and engulf the whole universe. Okay. All right. What about the real thing? Okay, I've shown you a bunch of theoretical movies, right? But in science, the whole point is that we have theories, but then we have observations or experiments that actually test this, right? How are we going to test this, right? We've made pictures of the baby universe, but a little bit later, when the universe is starting to form stars and galaxies, how are we going to test that? How are we going to check if those movies are correct? So... By now, you might have kind of caught on to what the answer to that is, okay? If I put up again this observable universe diagram with us in the middle here, looking outwards, okay? Uh, again, outside here, we can't observe, but this time I've colored in what we have systematically mapped out, right? What humans have mapped out in a systematic way. So there was the baby universe. We looked really, really far and looked really far back in time all the way to the baby universe. That's the cosmic microwave background here in this greenish, bluish, reddish ring. We've also looked really nearby, right? With more conventional telescopes, these conical regions show the extent of what we call galaxy surveys, where we're looking fairly close by. And so we are looking at basically the present day universe. Okay. All right. So we've seen the baby universe, and we've seen the adult universe. What we haven't seen are these intermediate sections, okay? So in other words, we've not looked at intermediate times. We have not had direct observations of the epoch of first star and galaxy formation, okay? It's like you look at a photo album, you have baby pictures, and you have adult pictures, but you're missing all the kid pictures, right? And as we know, children aren't just scaled down adults or scaled up babies. So, you know, we've got to fill in this gap. They are a unique species, okay? All right, this is where this new field that I'm talking about called 21 centimeter cosmology comes in. This is where we think we can fill in those gaps, where we can fill in those missing parts of the cosmic timeline. And here's the basic idea. And the basics are fairly simple. The idea is that if we want to look at the universe, it basically comes down to making big maps of what the universe looks like um, really, really far away. Okay? Now, hydrogen is everywhere in our universe. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in our universe. So if we have a way of seeing hydrogen, we're in business. We can look at where the hydrogen is and construct maps of the universe that way. Now, fortunately, the rules of quantum mechanics tell us that there is a way to see um, hydrogen. 
and that's via radio waves. So here's how it works. So um, hydrogen consists of a proton with an electron orbiting it. And quantum mechanics tells us that in certain uh, circumstances, it is correct to think about the proton and the electron as consisting of these little mini magnets. Okay? Now, if you've played with magnets, you know that they don't like to have the north poles close together like that. Right? Um, and if you try to force them in that position, very quickly they snap to this configuration. And in doing so, they release energy. Right? That's why if you have your fingers stuck between two heavy magnets, when they snap back, it hurts. The system is depositing energy into your fingers. In the case of the hydrogen atoms, there aren't any, aren't any fingers here, but the way the hydrogen atom gives off this energy is by giving off a radio wave with a wavelength of 21 centimeters. Okay. Now, with the magnets, you can also, if you really, really wanted the North Poles together, you can do it, right? You can force the magnets together, but you have to put in energy to do that, right? It's hard work. Same thing for the hydrogen atom. We can persuade a hydrogen atom to go back to this left, sp left state by basically giving it the energy, by giving it a radio wave with a wavelength of 21 centimeters, okay? So this gives us a way to look for hydrogen in our universe. We just look for where 21 centimeter wavelength radio waves are being absorbed or emitted. If there's a lot of absorption or emission in that direction, there must be a lot of hydrogen over there. Okay. And with this technique, uh, going back to this diagram here, the next few years are gonna result in mapping, the mapping of a lot more of our universe, okay? So I am primarily focused on this outer ring here, carefully chosen so that's just the right distance away so that we're looking just the right amount back in time that we can see uh, the formation of the first stars and galaxies, okay? Uh, other people at McGill, like Professor Matt Dobbs or professors, um, Professor Cynthia Chang and Professor John Sievers, they're um, putting a lot of their focus on doing 21 centimeter cosmology here to use this technique to trace out hydrogen uh, lit in the more adult universe. Lots of rich questions uh, for both cases. Uh, again, for me, I'm interested in this transition between the baby universe and the mature universe um, when these first galaxies are really dramatically affecting their environment, ionizing the atoms surrounding them and creating these bubbles that grow and grow and grow, which you can see here. First galaxies starting to form, not very big bubbles. Time goes on, these bubbles get larger and larger. Eventually, um, these galaxies are powerful enough to ionize all of, almost all of the intergalactic medium. And by studying these processes, we can start to learn about these first galaxies, which remain a mystery to us, okay? What is their nature? Are they like the ones that we see today? Or are they substantially different, right? Were they, for instance, much lower in mass? Did they emit the same sorts of X-rays? Or did they emit less? Did they emit more UV? What were they like? Uh, and how did they affect their environments? Right? This is one of the places in, in our research where astrophysics and astronomy, right, studying these first galaxies, really affects cosmology, affects the universe as a, as a whole. All right, how do we actually do this? I've talked vaguely about we go out and look for hydrogen absorption or emission. How do we actually do this? We start by building big radio telescopes, okay? So here are three examples of instruments that currently exist to do this sort of work, okay? Um, the one on the bottom left, that's called the Murchison Wide Field Array. This is situated in the Western Australian desert, okay? Boy, there are very few people around. Um, and just to give you a bit of a s scale, this is about the size of a, a, a moving truck. And each of these square things, you'll see if you look closely, consists of uh, 16 little squares. Each of these 16 little squares is a, is a radio antenna, okay? Not unlike the sort you might buy from an electronics store, okay? And these 16 are tied together into one super antenna, and then these telescopes are, uh, these sort of super antennas 
are distributed all over the landscape to act as one big super telescope. Uh, this next one is the Donald C. Backer Precision Array for Probing the Epic of Reionization. Okay, this is actually the one I've, I've worked on in the last, uh, last six years. Um, this here is in the South African Karoo Desert. So again, um, in the desert. Um, and now you can really see, in the case of paper, you can really see these really do look like plain uh, radio antennas that you might be able to buy off the shelf. Here's a third example. Here's LOFAR. This is much greener. This is not a desert. This is, in fact, right in the middle of the Netherlands. Okay? Uh, and so I say in the middle of the Netherlands, but not really. This core is in the Netherlands. Okay? But LOFAR is truly a gigantic telescope. These stations that they have with these radio antennas in there, they have them dotted all across Europe. Right, they have a station in front, they've got uh, some stations starting up in Eastern Europe and Germany and so on. Okay? So LOFAR, for instance, is truly a big radio telescope. All right, so looking at these things, you might say these just don't look like radio telescopes to me. Right? If you've seen the movie Contact right, with Jodie Foster, for instance, you're used to big dishes. Right? And those are a sort of radio telescope. Um, Here's me standing in front of an example big dish um, in New Mexico. And one of the fun things about being a, uh, someone who's in the field is when you visit, they actually let you go on and to get a sense of the scale for one of these dishes. These are like, you know, humans. Um, so there, you know, there are radio telescopes that are these big dishes, okay? But the sorts of instruments I'm talking about are a different class of radio telescopes known as radio interferometers. Uh, and to, to, to my mind, they're way cooler. Here's how it works. So with a radio interferometer, we just saw that there are a whole bunch of these uh, antennas dotted all over the landscape, right? So to simplify matters, let's just think about two of them. Okay, I've got an antenna over here and an antenna over there. And let's say there are some radio waves coming from this source, from the universe. And what you notice is, because the source is on this side, the radio waves hit this left antenna before they hit the right antenna. Okay? On the other hand, if we had a source on this side, they're going to hit this antenna first and then the, this left antenna second. What that means is that by looking at which antenna receives the signals first, I can tell them which side of the universe uh, this radio source uh, was, was coming from. Right? And you can go further. In fact, if you think about it, if I very precisely time the arrival times, the relative arrival times of radio waves coming, getting here and getting here, I can actually say exactly where in the sky uh, these radio waves are coming from. Now the situation gets a little bit more complicated when you think in 3D, right? Because if you imagine now these two antennas with this kind of going, this dotted line going into the screen here, then anything that's along this yellow arc, right? Any radio signals coming from somewhere on this arc are going to hit these two antennas at pretty much exactly the same time. Or put another way, if I get, if in my measurements I discover that the radio waves are hitting the, the, antenna, the two antennas at the same time, then yeah, I know something about where these radio waves are coming from, but it could be anywhere on this half of a McDonald's yellow arch, right? It could be anywhere on the, from there. And you can imagine that there's a simple solution to this. All I have to do is add a third antenna, right? If with this third antenna, if the signal Come, come into this third antenna really, really soon, that must mean the source is on this side, whereas if it comes really, really late, the source must be on that side, okay? And as you can imagine, the more of these antennas I add, the more precisely I'm able to do this sort of triangulation, and therefore, um, the, more the more precise my map of the sky is. Um, and that's why with instruments like the MWA, paper, LOFAR, and so on, you have all these antennas dotted all over the landscape, okay? Now, this lets me tell from which direction in the sky things are coming from, whether it's over there or over there. What it doesn't tell me is if I see radio waves coming from that direction, from how far away did these radio waves come from? Okay. 
21 centimeter cosmology provides an answer to that as well. So these hydrogen atoms that I'm looking at, we know that they're emitting radio waves of a wavelength of 21 centimeters, okay? But remember, we're looking at things that are billions of light years away, and because it's billions of light years away, these radio waves take billions of years to get to us, and in that time, the universe expands. And in doing so, it stretches out these wavelengths, so that by the time I receive this radio wave, um, it might not have a, ra a wavelength of 21 centimeters, it might have a wavelength of two meters. That's kind of typical for the sorts of observations that I'm involved in. Um, on the other hand, if I had a source of hydrogen radio emission closer in to me, you know, it's still far away in a cosmological sense, so as it travels here, it still takes some time and the universe still expands, but because it's closer, the universe doesn't have enough time to, ex to stretch out this wave by just by quite as much. So this wave that I receive might not be two meters in wavelength, but might just be one meter long. What that means is that by sorting out my, the, the, way, the radio waves I receive in terms of the wavelength, I can figure out from how far away the emission came from. And what that means is that not only can I make 2D maps of where the where there's strong hydrogen or weaker hydrogen, I can actually use this technique to make 3D maps of our universe, okay? Something more like this cube. All right, but as I've mentioned, um, this is a work in progress. This is a sneak preview of an upcoming field, so perhaps it shouldn't be um, a surprise to you that we haven't done something like this yet. This is a theory simulation, this is not real data. And the reason this is so hard is because we're looking for these really, really faint radio waves from cosmologically far away distances. But between us and these far away regions, there are lots of other things in our universe that emit in radio, okay? This is a picture of our Milky Way galaxy, our, our own galaxy. Um, but in radio wavelengths, okay? So if you had radio eyes, this is what the Milky Way galaxy would look like to you. This plane here, uh, this reddish, yellowish, greenish plane, that's the plane of where all the spiral arms reside, and so on, okay? These radio signals are 10,000 times brighter than the really faint cosmological signals we're looking for, and that's why this is hard, okay? And so because of this, we haven't yet made these really detailed maps. We're working on it, and we think we stand a good shot at being able, at getting there within the next few years. Now, we are making progress though, and in fact, one group um, has already claimed that they have seen some of the hydrogen signals from around the time the first stars are forming, okay? So this is really, very recent stuff, like March 1st, 2018, this paper came out from the EDGES collaboration. So this experiment that they have, this is another example of a, a radio antenna out in the Australian desert, so they also operate in the Western Australian desert, uh, claimed that they had seen some hydrogen signals from when the first stars were forming, okay? And in fact, this also included Dr. Raul Monsave, who is a, a, a research scientist here at McGill. Now, EDGES did not claim that, and nor were they designed to make a really detailed map like this, right? So what I said earlier about nobody's really made any of these detailed maps yet, um, that's still true. But what the EDGES collaboration went up, that was, let's forget all these details, right? Let's just average over all of this really coarsely, like this, and just say, well, how bright is it? Is it really, really bright? Is it less bright? Is it this color? Like, well, what's the average signal, right? How bright is this hydrogen signal um, in the early universe, okay? And from that, they, their data seemed to tentatively discover that the intergalactic gas around the time the first stars were forming was extremely cold. Now, how does that work? Well, here's how it works. 
So take an antenna, maybe it's the Edge's antenna, maybe it's your own favorite radio antenna that you bought. And suppose you're looking at some cold hydrogen gas in the early universe, okay? And let's suppose it's cold because nothing has ever uh, heated it up, okay? No galaxy has ever been near it, um, never heated it up with its X-rays, it's got no friends, it's just really, really cold, okay? Now, we're looking at this cold clump of hydrogen. Let's not forget that behind everything we see in our universe is the ultimate barrier, this hot plasma screen, okay? Which means that what you're really looking at is this hot backlight illuminating this really cold gas. And that is a huge contrast. If this were the case, this signal that we're trying to look for would be really easy to see. Okay? On the other hand, suppose this gas had friends and, and you know, it, things had warmed it up, okay? Then you'd be looking at a hot backlight illuminating this sort of lukewarm gas. It's much less of a temperature contrast that's much smaller signal that's a lot harder to see. So you can see that by looking at basically how strong the signals are in this early universe, you can get a sense for the temperature of the gases um, there, right? Like big signal, cold gas, small signal, warm gas. What EDGES found, which was absolutely incredible, was that the gas was really, really cold. So cold, in fact, that it was colder than if nothing had ever heated up ever in the entire age of the universe, okay? That's really weird, right? Like, how can you be colder than if no one had ever heated you up ever, right? So what can cause this? Okay, lots of theories. No, you know, if the edge's result is correct, uh, no one has a definitive answer for this is definitely what caused it. Here's an, a really cool example of what it could be due to. Let's talk about dark matter. Okay. So when we look at our universe, there's normal matter, like the atoms that uh, you and I are made of, the atoms that stars are made of, that intergalactic gas is made of. But then there's also this stuff called dark matter, okay, which pulls on us gravitationally, but otherwise, basically doesn't interact with regular matter at all, okay? And that includes not interacting with light. It basically doesn't interact with light, and so it's invisible, okay? Now, uh, dark matter is also believed to be cold, okay? A very cold thing. Uh, and as an example, if you look at a Milky Way galaxy here, um, the regular matter is here, that's where we live, but actually surrounding every galaxy, is this big cloud of dark matter, okay? Now, so keep that in your heads. Another thing I want you to keep in your heads is the fact that if I want heat to be transferred from, from, an, from a hot object to a cold object, there need to be interactions between the hot thing and the cold thing, right? In the case of an ice cube melting on my hand, it is the atoms directly interacting with each other, the atoms of the ice cube I'm receiving energy from the atoms of my hand, okay? In the case of, say, the sun warming us up, it's the sun interacting with us, in a sense, through the infrared rays that it's sending our way. But either way, to transfer heat, you have to have interactions. And so when the EDGES result came out, a lot of people got very excited because if I want something to be really cool, what I can do is find something colder that it can transfer heat to and then it can cool down. And so what people said was, well, dark matter is actually colder than, um, than the gas. And so if the dark matter can just interact a tiny little bit with this regular matter, there's a way for this regular matter to lose heat to this dark matter, this really cold sink. And that could potentially explain the edge's result. Okay. Now, I wanna stress that, you know, while this would be a fundamental breakthrough in cosmology, the edges result is very tentative, okay? It's tentative, it's controversial, as any groundbreaking new result uh, always is, right? And earlier on in this talk, I promised you a sneak preview of what's going on in this field, so you're seeing it here, right? This is something that 
scientists are not sure about. You know, people are checking this um, measurement, making sure that it really is real instead of some, for example, experimental artifact or some misinterpretation of the data or anything like that. The EDGES team did a great job designing their instrument. Um, some of the highest quality uh, radio engineering um, that, that people do in this area. Um, but still, lots of us are trying to check this result because it's so important. Uh, my research group is focused on checking this with a brand new instrument known as HERA, the Hydrogen Epic of Reionization Array. So HERA is intending to go ahead and to try to make some of these detailed maps to try to understand those detailed patterns. And this is an artist's conception of what it's gonna look like when it's built. It's a truly big radio telescope. Uh, again, lot, consisting of lots of little mini telescopes. So this is an, an interferometer. Each dish here is 14 meters in diameter. And this is situated in the South African Karoo Desert again. Uh, here's another picture. Uh, this is actually one of the test dishes that we built in West Virginia. Um, to test things out. This is a fun photograph. This, uh, uh, you know, happy looking guy in the hat here. Uh, this is Danny Jacobs, Professor Danny Jacobs, one of my colleagues in the collaboration. He's at uh, Arizona State University. And he has a really fun job of taking students out to one of these test dishes and they fly drones. So these drones go high up and they have radio transmitters. Uh, basically simulating radio waves coming down, raining down from the universe to test out the capabilities of our dish to make sure that it's all performing the way uh, we hope it performs. Here's a construction scene from a few years ago in the South African desert. These white frames are actually the old experiment paper that I talked about that's now uh, decommissioned. These telephone poles are the uh, supports for the Hera antennas that I showed you in the artist's conception. This is Catherine Rosie, um, our project engineer in South Africa. I'm doing surveying work to make sure the poles are put in the right place. Uh, this is Zakia Lee, one of the graduate students in the uh, collaboration uh, out there doing some construction work. Here's, some, here's Karina Cheng, um, another graduate student doing uh, construction work on the same trip. Uh, here's some of the dishes in a more complete stage. Uh, this here, um, you can see what happens here. This is what we call a feed. Um, and so radio waves come in here, get focused by this dish and get received by this feed, which is really just an antenna. Um, here you see a close up of that as it's being you know, hauled up. So this is with even more dishes built these guys all plug into these uh, things that we call receiverators, which is, um, you know, uh, uh, a combination of the, the word receiver for something that, you know, it's receiving the signals and refrigerator because this is a hot desert and we got to keep our electronics cool. And then all of this basically plugs into what amounts to a supercomputer operating out in the desert. Okay. Um, and um, this, does an initial stage of processing, um, uh, averages some of the data in some ways, um, and will basically compress it to the point where it is actually transferable um, across the internet to, to us, where we can analyze um, our data in the comforts of uh, Montreal. Um, and this actually, this is pretty substantial. Sometimes we do get in trouble with South Africa for using up too much of their internet bandwidth. Um, uh, so here's a, a photo from about um, a year and a half ago when we about had 19 of these dishes constructed. So you can see humans here for scale. Here's Catherine again with her staff inspecting the array. Uh, this is a more recent photograph when we had about 60 antennas. Um, now we're up to about 100. And by about this time next year, we will have constructed um, all 350 of this uh, final instrument. So if you're interested, our website is reionization.org um, and you can read more about this experiment um, and what we hope to be able to do with this. For now, I'll just say that really exciting times are ahead, okay? Uh, this is us in the middle. 
having surveyed the nearby universe and the baby universe. Hera will uh, basically survey what's in this dark blue ring plus a little bit more. But as I mentioned, this is the beginning of a very promising field. And at, in the decades to come, in principle, 21 centimeter cosmology can allow us to access everything in light blue here. So this truly will be a very exciting time. Thank you very much. Yep, um, that is precisely the right question to ask. That is precisely what I spent almost all of my PhD working on. Um, and that is um, basically the same as this question, okay? Basically, yeah, you know, uh, you know s between one to two meters, you're talking about, you know, radio frequencies of 100 to 200 megahertz, and there are things in our universe closer by that emit in 100 to 200 megahertz. The way it turns out you, you, you do this is um, you, you look at patterns in the frequency. So it turns out that suppose I were to plot the strength of the contaminants as a function of frequency, it turns out to be a relatively smooth curve due to the physics of how um, these things, um, these contaminants are generated. But if you look at the sort of signals that we're looking at, okay, uh, remember different uh, frequencies or different wavelengths correspond to different distances away. If you look at different slices of this cube, which are basically different distances away, it's really chaotic, right? So if I worked out like what that would look like um, plotting that as a function of frequency, it's gonna look like this, okay? So basically, I separate out the really smooth, nicely varying things, which are characteristic of my contaminant, for things that look like this, and that, in principle, allows me to separate out the um, signal from the contaminants. But, obviously, because we haven't made one of these yet, we're still working on it. Yeah. Sure. Um, so there are several things to unpack there, right? So first of all, the this effect here, that I can sort out the different wavelengths um, uh, to, in order to figure out from how far away the emission came from, that requires me knowing that uh, everything that was emitted here was emitted at a, at a particular wavelength, right? Um, and so, first of all, I need to identify things that emit in particular wavelengths, right? So, for example, if there were random, you know, light bulbs out there in the universe, that wouldn't do because that, you know, emits in all sorts of wavelengths. Hydrogen atoms conveniently have this 21 centimeter transition, as we call it, that. Um, forces it to emit at exactly this wavelength. So first of all, there's, so then there are a finite number of possibilities, right? Um, and so the answer is we do look at other lines. Um, so for example, um, there are people, um, some colleagues of mine, for example, that use, say, lines from carbon monoxide molecules or ionized carbon molecules. Um, and uh, the, 
each sort of line can probe a different part of the observable universe, and they basically have all their different science applications that they're good at. Um, they're, uh, for example, um, uh, carbon monoxide. That's very sensitive to what my colleague Carter Keating likes to call OMG, the onset of molecular gas. Um, in our universe, so that's another phase of our universe where molecules are starting to form. Um, and another crucial thing that is absolutely crucial here is, um, yes, there are you know, lots of atoms that emit light in terms of all these spectral lines, so you might say, well, there should be so many possibilities, not just the few you mentioned, like you know, hydrogen and carbon monoxide ionized carbon. One problem with a lot of these other possibilities, for example, hydrogen can actually turn, turns out it also emits strong UV lines. Some of these are too good at being absorbed. So you can't look at things um, billions of light years away, right? Um, and you can't build these, these 3D maps. So the implicit assumption with being able to see the back of this cube is that once the radio waves have been emitted from the back of it, it doesn't get absorbed until it re reaches my telescope. And that is true for things like the 21 centimeter line and not true for a lot of other lines. That's a great question, right? Like you, you might say, well, you know, uh, your 21 centimeter wave was stretched out to, to two meters, but then you might have had something that started out, um, say, 92 centimeters or something. Deuterium does that, um, where that wasn't quite stretched out that much, but it's two meters as well. So the, the correct answer to this, which sounds incorrect, but is correct, <laughs> is luck, okay? Our, our universe was very kind to us. If you look at the distances we're interested in and the typical stretch factors, if you will, and you write down all the different possible, um, what we call interloper lines, like the 92 centimeter line um, or carbon monoxide lines and so on, and you ask, could there possibly be things out there at the right distances to stretch just the right amount to, for one line to masquerade as a different one? It turns out that we're just lucky and nature was built in a way that there weren't, aren't many other lines to confuse with the 21 centimeter line. That's not true for the carbon monoxide and, and ionized carbon mappers that I talked about earlier. Um, people who work on that actually have to worry about those two lines getting confused with one another and they have additional data analysis techniques that they can do for, for that. And if you're interested, come down, we'll talk, and I can give you more details. Thank you.